How do you continuously improve any system? Any system or subsystem? Well, firstly, you have to define what's a system. System has five parts. Every system has a goal. In order to achieve the goal, you have to do some kind of work, make products or services. In order to do the work, you need resources. The goal determines what resources you need and how much of every one you need. If you don't have enough of any one of those, it's a constraint. Any resource you don't have enough of is a constraint. You might not have enough demand, capacity, supply, or cash. The goal also determines what rules you need to manage the work and the resources by. This is where it gets tricky, because you have to figure out what's the rules to win the game. What's the rules to achieve more and more of the goal? And lastly, you need metrics that give you feedback from which you can learn. Lag metrics, are we achieving the goal? Lead metrics, why are we not achieving the goal? And compliance metrics, are we following the rules? So that's what a system is. What are we trying to continuously improve? We're trying to continuously improve the goal, whether that goal is impact or income. Impact goal would be, I want to feed people. I start with one, and then in our mindset, if we go 100x, you want to go from one to 100, 100 to 10,000, 10,000 to a million, a million to 100 million. Continuously improving the system, if the system is an impact organization or for-purpose organization, is more and more of that goal. If the goal is income, same thing. I start with making a dollar, then $100, then $10,000. I want more and more and more of that. That's the definition of a goal. But it's very important that the goal is so clearly defined that every manager at every level of an organization can figure out what work they have to do, they, the, their team, how much resources they need. Because it's the job of every manager to ensure they have enough. Enough to do the work that the system is placing on them. So we go back to the objective. We're trying to continuously improve a system. How do you go about doing that? There's two very different approaches. One approach, a traditional approach, says if you want to improve the system, you have to improve each part of the system. You have to manage each part of the system. So analyze, improve, and manage each part of the system. The problem with that approach is it doesn't result in the system improving. It results in the parts improving. The sum of all the local improvements doesn't give you a system improvement. So you need to follow a systems approach. You need to analyze and improve and manage the system. But how the hell do you do that? That was a challenge that I thought would be an interesting thing to go and learn. I went and studied engineering. And fast forward, everything I have done in my career has been around this thing. While I was studying engineering, I read a book, The Goal written by somebody that was going to become my mentor, Dr. Eli Goldratt, and he solved the problem for the first time. There is no other solution from a systems thinking, systems approach perspective on how do you continuously improve the system. What his insight was, was a beautiful example of a quote that I, that I discovered while I was studying engineering. It was a quote by the physicist Jean-Baptiste Perrin. He said that the aim of all science is to substitute visible complexity for invisible simplicity. Any system, doesn't matter whether you have a single person dentist firm or an incredibly complex Fortune 500 company, when you look at it, there's a tremendous amount of visible complexity. How the heck do we find invisible simplicity? It's there, like with Einstein's equation, E equal to mc squared. It's beautifully simple, but it's hidden. We had to discover it, and it explains an enormous amount of complexity. So what makes it so challenging is when we're trying to continuously improve organizations, we are immediately confronted by all the visible complexity. There are so many problems. 
there are so many parts that we can improve. How the heck do we differentiate between the many things that can be improved, can be solved, and a few, or maybe the one that must? That's what I want to share with you just briefly today. I'm going to share with you as I go through two case studies. I'm going to start with an extreme case. Microsoft. A couple of years back, I was contacted by one of my students that said that Microsoft had recently purchased Nokia and it wasn't a great acquisition. One of the ways that they could get some kind of value from it was to combine the SAP systems of these two companies. Have only one that could save them some money. And the question was, okay, well, how are we going to do that? And while we're doing that, what else can we do? And I said, well, let's use it as an opportunity to redesign our end-to-end -end supply chain. Microsoft was essentially a make-to-stock company. For those that don't know, they actually make a lot of physical products. They make keyboards, mouses, Surface Pros, HoloLenses, Xboxes, right? So they wanted to come up with a completely new design for their end-to-end -end supply chain. What problem were they solving? Is they were falling behind. Their supply chain was unreliable. It was unresponsive. There were frequent shortages and surpluses across this whole spectrum of products. So imagine walking into that organization as the CTO at the time did, and you are confronted with all these issues. So I got this call from the student. He said, Alan, I convinced them that they should listen to you, that you might have a way of doing this very quickly. And you've been invited to come and spend two days with us. I said, fantastic. He said, when can you be there? I said, I was on my way back to South Africa. I can be there literally tomorrow morning. Picked me up at the airport, driving back to the head office. And the guy that picked me up, my ex-student, says to me, Alan, I've got good news and bad news for you. I said, what's the good news? He said, we have the CTO of Microsoft Global Supply Chain in the room. That's a big deal. I said, what's the bad news? He said, you have one hour to convince him. I said, OK. And what happens if I do? He says, then you have the rest of the day to convince his direct reports. They have been preparing all the possible yes buts, all the reservations. I said, great. And what happens if I manage to achieve this crazy objective? He said, then the second day we'll use to start planning the implementation. I said, wow. I found out from the CTO as I arrived that they wanted to go live with a new global end-to-end -end supply chain design in December, 15th of December. This was the 1st of September. I kind of joked and said, uh, 15th of December next year, right? They said, no, this year. So I'll start off with just the outcome, and then I'll show you what I did in that one hour with the CEO, which if you give me your full attention for the next 20 minutes, I'll take you through it, and you can take away that process. It's a simple five-step process, but it forces focus at every step. I call it five pairings. There's a one-to-one -one relationship that you have to apply at every step in the process. That's how you achieve and sustain focus. So let's listen to the, the results. My name is Robert Nishu. I'm Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft Supply Chain, responsible for everything from how we source product uh, all the way through how we take care of customers uh, if they have any sort of problem running the technology, the prioritization of all those programs. Um, and I'm faced with a lot of challenges. And about a year and a half ago, we were faced with uh, increasing supply chain complexity, uh, a rising inventory levels, increased number of markdowns, and a lot of demand variability, especially as we introduce new product categories such as HoloLens or Surface 2-in-1s. So we reached out to Goldbrat Labs to really help us think through uh, some of the nuances of the problem. And through that work, we were able to implement a new TOC planning model in our existing execution uh, and supply chain systems. Um, the outcome has been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, in that time, we've seen our service levels rise to our customers by a little over 5%. At the same time, we've seen our inventory levels drop by a quarter of a billion dollars uh, across the board. 
which has led to reduced markdowns and reduced excess and obsolescence of about $100 million. So certainly everyone over here at Microsoft has moved from theory of constraints being just a theory to TOC actually being a reality, a reality that has really driven our business to a place that it wasn't before. So think about that. We did the whole design of the solution the testing of that solution in a, in a simulation model to make sure that the new rules that we were coming up with is actually going to be winning rules. And what do we mean by winning rules? It will dramatically reduce shortages and surpluses. That's what you heard him say. We reduced inventories within the first year by a quarter of a billion dollars and the second year by another quarter of a billion dollars. And at the same time, we reduced shortages or stockouts First year, we increased sales by over 100 million. In the second year, by over 200 million, just by reducing stockouts. And all it took, same resources, just figuring out what rules to use to win the game. Right. So how did I go into that meeting? And you can imagine, I was massively nervous. Right. I've worked with big companies over 30 years, but Microsoft is something very special and very unique. So how do I do it? How do I share with them essentially my glasses to say, this is what we're going to do, exactly step by step? So it starts with the first pairing of the goal and the constraint. There should be a one-to-one -one relationship between these two things. You have an income goal and a constraint something that you don't have enough of currently to achieve that goal. The same is true for impact. I did a project with the UN World Food Program a few years ago. They were generating about $3 billion of donations. They wanted to increase it by 10%. That was their goal. Where was the constraint? They didn't have enough cash to be able to provide more food in terms of emergency relief. That was the scarce resource, the amount of cash that they had available. For Microsoft, it was they had a, I can't share with you what their income goal was for all these physical products, uh, but you can imagine it's tens of billions of dollars. And what was the constraint? They didn't have enough demand for those products. So Microsoft, demand constraint, UN World Food Program, cash constraint. Small little company that I recently worked with, chiropractor firm, they have enough demand, they don't have enough capacity. Right? One goal, one constraint. So there's some kind of process through which you are doing the work to achieve that goal. Right? The goal determines how much of the resources you need to eat, do each of those steps. And then you can plot out how much do I have of that resource? How much demand do I have? How much capacity do I have in each step of the process? In sales, in marketing, in finance, in HR, in procurement, in operations. Right? As I mentioned, the goal has to be clear enough that every level of the organization can figure out what work they have to do, what resources they need, and how much of every resource they need. You can work backwards to calculate that often. So you can see there, we have one of those resources that we don't have enough of to achieve the goal. That's our constraint. You can get situations where you don't have enough of anything, right? You've set a goal on no basis at all, you didn't consider your constraint when you were setting the goal, and as a result, you don't have enough demand, capacity, supply, cash, or the last one, which I didn't mention, is management attention. This is the ultimate constraint, right? We have to figure out how to manage our part of the system, how to analyze it, how to improve it. Now, what fear of constraints did, which was this massive breakthrough, it applied this idea of invisible simplicity by saying that there's a hack. You can actually analyze and improve and manage the whole system 
by analyzing, improving, and managing the constraint of that system. It's a huge ability to focus, a huge leverage point. Think about it. If you have a system with five steps in it, I'm now focusing on just analyzing, improving, and managing one rather than five, right? So it gives me one to five leverage in that effect. If I have 500 steps in that process, there's still only one constraint, one weakest link. Does that make sense? So that is the kind of the hack that makes the systems approach practical. Because it says you can actually analyze, manage, and improve the whole system by analyzing, improving, and managing the constraint. Very simple, but not easy. And that's where the next steps come from. Because this is our first one-to-one -one pairing. Are you clear about your goal in terms of either income or impact? Is it clear enough that your management team at every level can figure out what work they have to do, what resources they need, and how much of every resource they need. Now, how do we know that we don't have enough of a resource? You can, of course, do some calculations to s compare demand with capacity, or you can simply check what are we waiting for? Where's the backlog? Where there's a bottleneck, there's a backlog, right? So that's another way that you can check if you, if you don't have enough of something, is the flow of the work is waiting for something. What is it waiting for? So the next pairing is going from constraint to problem. So I'm taking this gap that says, this is what I have. It could be demand. It could be capacity. It could be supply. It could be cash. The goal determines what I need. There's a gap. How do I close the gap? That gap is made up of problems that I have to solve. Does that make sense to everybody? And this is where 80-20 is useful. 80-20, as you've probably learned, is fractal. It applies on itself. So it basically says that it doesn't matter how many things there are that makes up that gap, 20% of those problems will give you 80% of the effect of the gap that you're looking to close, right? But 20% of 20%, which is four, will give you 80% of 80%, which is 64% of that gap. And then you can apply it again, and it basically says that there's one problem that will give you at least half the gap. That's the problem to solve now. Does it make sense to everybody? So even though there could be multiple reasons why we don't have enough, for example, if I'm running a machine, I could be losing capacity because I'm overproducing. I'm producing a batch of 100 when the clients only need 20. Or I've produced 100 features in my software when the users are only using 20. That's overproduction, right? Stopping overproduction is the problem I'm trying to solve. How do I stop overproducing? It could also be starvation blockage, quality issues, or downtime, planned and unplanned, etc. These are the problems, right? So the same with if demand, if I don't have enough demand, what problems do I need to solve to get customers to pay more, buy more, buy more frequently? There could be many problems that I would have to solve, but there's always one that will probably give me at least 50% of the gap. That's the one problem to start. For Microsoft, it was to solve the problem of shortages and surpluses. If we could do that, we would get customers to, to be willing to, in some cases, pay more, buy more, buy more frequently. In the situation for the UN World Food Program, the main problem was that most of the money was getting stuck in the regions. So they take that $3 billion, everybody submit their forecast of what emergencies they are likely going to be in their region, and then they push most of the money there. What happens, do you think, if you get or ask for more money than what you actually needed in the year? What do you think will happen? Would you give it back? No. That will take us to the next step which is now that we have the problem, 
the next one-to-one -one pairing that we're looking for is problem conflict. So we have a problem. There's a solution to the problem. But the solution is one side of a conflict. And that's often the mistake that we make is we either jump to the solution, not considering that there's alternatives, or we simply get stuck when we know there's an alternative and we don't know what to do. Why can we get stuck? Because each of the alternatives, whether it is to implement the solution as a change or not implement the solution, which is maintain the status quo, or to implement another type of solution for that problem, if status quo is no longer an option, each one of these options have got unique pros and cons. So none of those two are viable options. If I implement the solution, I have to give up the positives of the status quo. And I have to live with the cons of the solution. That makes it not viable. The status quo is not viable. Why? Because I have to give up the unique pros of the solution, and I have to live with the cons of the status quo. But this helps me to understand what is the conflict. People often say, define the problem precisely, and you are halfway to a solution. This is the way to define a problem precisely. Any problem can be defined as an unresolved conflict. Does that make sense to everybody? If you try to find out why people are procrastinating, right, why there's inertia, go and look at this diagram. It will tell you that there's some positive related to the status quo that they, that they don't want to give up. Or there's some con related to the new solution that they don't want to have to live with. So from the diagram, you can read off the reason why somebody gets stuck. Make sense to everybody? If you want to see why somebody overreacts, you can also read it off the diagram. So why did they jump to a solution? They have some kind of exaggerated frustration with the cons of the status quo, or they might have an exaggerated expectation of the future situation, those unique pros. So exaggerated fears of losing a positive or exaggerated fears of the effort or the risk of making the change explain why we get stuck. Exaggerated frustrations and expectations explain why we often overreact. Now, in Microsoft's case, their conflict was very simple. Do I make stuff to stock to maintain high availability, quick response, but face the risk of sitting with the wrong stock, way too much stock? Or do I make to order? And if the client doesn't know in advance what they need, I'm actually not taking orders from the client. I'm taking forecasts from the client. And if the retailer ends up having too much, I just return it. So we had to find a way of resolving that conflict as part of our solution. Test it in the simulation model to see if it's actually going to help. For the UN World Food Program, remember the problem was they didn't have enough cash because it was stuck in the regions. They generally would ask for more because if they don't get enough cash, people die. So if you don't know how much you need, right, then you, and people can die if you don't have enough cash, you'll ask for a little bit more. But what if you ask for too much? You should send it back, but they don't. Why not? Because they themselves are in a conflict between spend what I have or lose it. Right? And I won't just lose it this year. I will lose it next year. Almost every government agency faces the same problem. Have you heard of that? Spend it or lose it, right? We found out that about 10% of the total cash in the system was being lost because of the spend it or lose it. They end up having to spend it because they asked for it, buying stuff that's not needed. And their goal was to increase the availability of cash by 10%. So just solving that problem would have helped them to achieve the goal without raising any more donation funds. And by the way, with all of our simulation for most government agencies, between 5 to 10% of every budget is wasted through spend it or lose it. And you see it at every level. 
at the, at the federal level, expenses on a weekly basis are tracking around $10 billion. Weeks, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, it's tracking at 50, 60 billion dollars. Because people have budget left, and if they don't spend it, they lose it. So again, define the problem precisely, and you're halfway to a solution. Define the problem as a conflict. For the chiropractor, their conflict is, I don't have enough capacity. Don't have enough chiropractor to, to, to meet all the demand. Their conflict is, do I try to squeeze more out of what I've got, or I simply hire more? And until they resolve that conflict, they're stuck. There's pros and cons of each of those options. We don't get taught how to solve conflicts. We get taught how to compromise. Pick options that have trade-offs. So that leaves us to the next one-to-one -one pairing, which is conflict innovation. Problem solving is finding a solution to a problem. True innovation is finding a solution to a problem without trade-offs. So imagine looking at that conflict and saying, what is the need? What are we trying to achieve? I need to come up with a viable option that gives me all the pros without any cons. That it would be an innovation. Does it make sense to everybody? And that's essentially what we ended up doing with both Microsoft and the UN Food Program. We highlighted this conflict, got all the stakeholders together, made sure that everybody had an opportunity to list their unique pros and cons for this plan change and the unique pros and cons of the status quo. And we said, we want a new solution that gives us all or at least most of the pros with as few or none of the cons. That becomes the requirement for the solution. In the case of Microsoft, we ended up designing a complete theory of constraints-based solution for planning and execution their supply chain. Uh, part of that solution was deciding, based on comparing the customer tolerance time with the supply lead time, what should be make to stock, make to order, assemble to order, engineer to order. So if a customer tolerance time is zero, guess where you need stock? at the point where they buy, right? But if their tolerance time is two days, you can keep the inventory two days back in the supply chain. And rather than making to stock, you can now assemble or bundle to order. So rather than coming up with every possible configuration for an Xbox, with every possible controller and game, you say, let the customers decide, and we simply bundle it together right at the end. So I'm keeping components of all the Xboxes, all the games, all the controllers, and I simply are bundling to order or assembling to order. If they are willing to wait 30 days, you can go back all the way to the raw materials. So that was the solution we came up with, and we had to test it. Same with the, with the World Food Program. I came up with this idea. I had, had to rhyme because spend it or lose it is such a nice thing. So I came up with the idea of save it and share it. So if you've been frugal the whole year, or you were just lucky that the demand on your department was less than expected, which meant that you are sitting with excess budget available, you can keep 50% of that and apply it to any line item, any priority that you want. And the other 50% you return back to the treasury. The conflict that they have is between spending everything or returning everything. They can't spend things across line items because it's not allowed by policy. So with this policy, we had an actual adoption of a new policy that says if you save this money, you give back 50%, the other 50% you can spend across any line item that's prioritized. That was true innovation. It gave us all the pros, none of the cons. The last pairing that we've got to find the one thing is to think about innovation experiment. We do not learn from experience. We learn from experiments. 
we have to be very clear what is the assumptions that we are trying to test. Because ultimately the check is, is the problem solved? Do we now have more of that resource that we didn't have enough of? That should be the experiment. Does this make sense to everybody? That's the thing that I want to go and test. So when it comes to this, you've heard in lean startups, they talk about minimally viable product. There's a step before that, which is minimally viable experiment. It's to be so clear about the assumptions that I'm testing that by implementing this change, I'm going to get more of the thing that I don't have enough of. We call it a minimally viable experiment. Before you even start building stuff, you test it like that. And this is one of the things that my research lab has developed. Many of these experiments today, you can do virtually. We build digital su supply chains. For Microsoft, we built a, a digital twin of their supply chain all the way from raw materials to the end retailer. So when we came up with different rules of managing the system, we can simulate their last year with the way that they were running last year, see what their performance was, and then re-simulate that, but just changing the rules. So Damien and uh, the Chemtech team here, we had a, an experiment where we were using the same digital twin for them. They have a relatively small distributor that supplies four different product categories. It's like, can you do better? Right? Coming up with, oh, we're currently using a simple min-max way of managing inventories. Is there a better way of managing inventories? Yes, there's a, a little bit more sophisticated way. Can we test it? We re-ran their last year performance with the old rules and the new rules and see how much additional free cash flow will be generated. So one of our big innovations has been not to build these digital twins from scratch, which used to take three to 24 months. It now takes us three to 24 seconds. We build them directly from data that's already sitting in the IT system. So that's kind of the last part is, right, now that you've solved that problem, you have more of that constraint resource. You have more demand, you have more capacity, you have more supply, you have more, more cash, or you have more management attention, if that was your constraint, right? Has the amount of goal units gone up? If so, and the constraint is still that resource, I still don't have enough of it, then what's the second problem to solve? Or maybe I've improved that one so much that the constraint have now moved somewhere else. And then I just follow, keep on following the process. So that's where I want to leave you today, but I hope that was helpful. For me, this is the essence of continuous improving systems, is having a very simple framework that you can apply and apply at every level, right? Whether you're applying this at a company level or even a group level or department level, they can go through the same steps. They can say, do I have enough resources to meet the demand that the system is placing on me? Whether that demand is the number of invoices I need to process, the amount of quality samples I need to process, the amount of new people I need to hire, the amount of widgets or services I have to produce. Do I have enough resources to do that? If not, what's the problem to solve? The last part that I want to finish off with is I recently got invited to attend a two-day workshop by Alex and Leila Ormozzi. Who of you follow them online? Show of hands. If you don't, make a note. Follow them online. Alex and Leila Ormozzi. I have never seen business owners apply theory of constraints with the discipline that they do. Hormozi. H-O-R-M-O-Z-I. The two-day workshop was how they apply theory of constraints in their own company, in their portfolio of companies, and they were teaching people in the workshop to do this. I'll give you a simple example of the application of this. We had a round table between, there were about 100 people in the, in the workshop. And I had a round table similar to what we had previously, where people were confirming, this is my goal, this is the constraint. What don't I have enough of, right? So uh, remember that, that's now done. Everybody has answered that question. So Alex or Mosey gets gets on, on stage and he's presenting about lead generation. 
and somebody is asking a question. And he says, Alex, I saw you recently present uh, options in Facebook on how to generate leads. I found it very interesting. Uh, can you expand a bit more about it? And Alex, rather than answering the question, which clearly was, he had the capability to doing it, he said, I just want to check. Um, in the previous round, you confirmed your goal, and you confirmed that you have a capacity constraint, right? Like the chiropractor, right? We have a capacity constraint. And his response was brutal and direct. Why the hell are you asking me about lead generation? That's not the problem you're trying to solve. You're trying to solve the problem of getting more capacity, right? In the lowest cost, lowest risk way. And when you see that level of, of discipline, of not getting distracted with all the ways that you could possibly improve every part of your organization, and this is where auditing to me is so fundamentally flawed. This is why best practice comparisons are so fundamentally flawed, because you can do an audit on every single function in your organization, and you can find gaps between their performance and best practice. And as soon as the gap has been identified, it goes on a to-do list. Do you agree? And then management is overwhelmed. Because there's so many things that I now have to improve upon. The only way to step back and find that inherent simplicity is to maintain this one-to-one -one relationship. There's a relationship between a what and a how. One-to-one. -one. Not one-to-many, one-to-one. A single goal, a single constraint. What am I trying to achieve? How do I do it by getting more of the constraint? There's a single one-to-one -one relationship between the goal, between the constraint and the problem. What am I trying to achieve? I'm trying to get more of the constraint. That's the what. How? I need to solve this problem. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the problem and the conflict. Between the conflict and the innovation, between the innovation and the experiment, and going back to step one. Thank you very much.